Okay, so this is chapter, the first chapter of the textbook Forecasting Principles and Practices, um, third edition. Okay, so these are the, the main topics of this chapter, which is kind of an introduction uh, to what is, is going to be, you know, the rest of the discussion. And one, the first one is uh, what, what is a forecast or in, in the book, it says what can be forecasted, right? But we have to begin with some kind of definition of what a forecast is. So we have a, a good you know, sense, a good framework of what we're discussing. And then uh, in any forecast, you need to have certain objectives, right? Clear objectives, like in a business plan, certain objectives and planning, you know, to guide the, the process of forecasting, so it doesn't go, you know, you know, uh, in the in the in the in the in the sidelines. Then the author talks about forecasting data and methodology um, and methods, and we're going to discuss some of it. Very, you know, very basic. Then there's a chapter that talks about four case studies. That one. Uh, we're going to do an exercise. At the end, it's the first exercise, and it talks about two case studies in particular, okay? So we're going to be talking about those two. If you want, you can, you know, on your own time, uh, uh, check the other two, but those cases, three and four, are the ones that are being discussed in, in the exercise one. So we can, you know, uh, sh shoot a, uh, one bird, you know, two, two, two birds in one stone, okay? Sorry for the birds. <laughs> then, uh, and then discuss also some basic steps on how to approach a real world, you know, forecasting task. So the first thing I try, you know, always in my, you know, my delivery uh, to try to get some interactivity, you know, with, with the audience. So, uh, let me ask you, when you hear the word forecast, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? You can write it in the chat or you can say it, you know, it, it doesn't matter. So, but what, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Crystal ball. Right, huh? Yeah, I, I, I had that one too, right? Yeah, the crystal ball, right? You know, the this uh, soothsayer or, you know, fortune teller, right? That uh, has the crystal ball and has all the answers for you, right? Uh, what, what else, what, what else comes to mind when you hear the word forecast? Uh, predicting, uh, very good, uh, uh, Ferica, predicting, uh, prevention, okay. Um, so in this, uh, in, in, in this book, forecast is really an estimate. Of course, we are trying to predict uh, some future event depending on the past uh, information that we have, right? You know, to make the best estimate of what it's going. And that's what we call really a prediction, right? But it's not a prediction that comes out of a hat. So it comes from analytical uh, thinking and also trying to do the best estimate that we have from past experience, okay? So in the introduction, in that chapter, uh, uh, the author gives you a little bit of background of historic background in terms of uh, the forecasting ha has been with us since the beginning of, uh, you know, of, of, the, of the human history basically, or, or prehistory. And, uh, you know, if, if you go back, you know, to your history lessons or your social sciences, uh, there were some cultures that uh, for, try to forecast uh, future events uh, depending on certain natural phenomena that, that occur in the, you know, in, in their day life. For example, if, it, if there was an eclipse, for example, astrology, you know, uh, was, a big part of it. Also, uh, checking the entrails of an animal, for example. Uh, the Babylonians did that, the Greeks did that, Romans, etc. But going 
a little bit forward in more of our you know times it was interesting in the in the in that chapter that the author gives us some of the some some of the predictions that some people did you know around the the 20th century that of course you know they are kind of ridiculous you know uh, in today's day but at that time the information that they had if you extrapolate that information that could have been a possibility right so for example the chairman of ibm in 1943 and ibm we know what what the company is right international business machine one of the leaders in technology he, he said that i think there's a world market for maybe five computers okay remember 1943 in 1943 if i'm not mistaken there were only two computers that existed at that time okay the one in britain that decoded the enigma uh, uh cipher uh germans it was called the colossus or something like that and then another one which was the ENIAC in back, back in the you said there was only two uh computers that, that we can you know uh, circuits transistors all that so it was possible right to predict okay you know maybe we all just need five computers <laughs> in the world because there, there was a massive investment to build a computer you know it take it took a lot of resources okay so you know how how that 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 went then in popular mechanics in 1949 about six years you know from that prediction of the chairman of ibm popular mechanics said that computers in the future may weigh no more than 1.5 tons okay okay so i don't know if you can see this guy here okay that this this is an iphone this is a computer <laughs> and of course it doesn't weigh more than you know a couple of ounces right so uh that prediction also went to the bin dust of history oh, wait. then more recently and this one uh i I'm, I'm a witness because i remember reading this okay i was around i got i went to carbon date myself i was 15 years you know in 1977 so uh the president of DEC, DEC is Digital Equipment Corporation. I used to work, that was my first uh, job in electronic uh, manufacturing. Uh, I used to work for a company called Emulus Caribe in, from Costa Mesa, from California. They had a manufacturing site in Puerto Rico. And we used to make, you know, these big circuit boards for digital equipment, uh, uh, you know, computers. Okay, there were really many, many computers at that time. And it was a very prof profitable business. So in 1977, the president of that company, Digital Equipment Corporation, said that there is no reason anyone will want a computer in their home. Okay? Three years later, IBM invented what it was called the PC, the personal computer. Uh, you know how, the, how, the, how that, that, that went. So uh, the, the, the morale, the morale of this story, uh, be careful what you forecast, <laughs> okay? Uh, make assumptions, make, uh, you know, make a lot of, uh, make a lot of extraordinary assumptions, as we call it in the appraisal business. When we don't know anything or there's some, you know, uh, leeway for things going one way or the other, uh, we call extraordinary assumptions to cover our behind, CYA, okay? So uh, yeah, just be careful because these people were really reputable people at the time. Popular mechanics, chairman of IBM, president of digital equipment, like a president of Apple, for example. Okay. So uh, yeah. So it's a, it's a cautionary tale. I think that the author is trying to, you know, tell us. Uh, be careful what you forecast because it could go really, really bad. And of course, you know, uh, nobody's one hundred percent infallible. Uh, there will be times when your forecast is not, you know, the, the way it's supposed to be, especially if you are forecasting during, for example, the beginning of uh, COVID. Okay, uh, that was a tough time, you know, for people that are in this, in this business, because it was something that didn't happen in hundred years. Okay, so uh, be 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 sensible, be sensible to you know a, a lot of outliers and a lot of you know uh, uh, balls from the left field. Okay, so again, what is a forecast? So Johnny Carson, he was the late night show, you know, uh, 
host for, I think it was for 30 years. Okay, he had a record there in the Guinness. Uh, you know, he, he used to uh, say, you know, in, the, in, his, in his persona, he used to do forecasts for everything. And it was, you know, it was always a, a joke, right? But this business is not a joke, right? Uh, we have to really take it very seriously. So let's do another exercise, okay? And this one, we're going to use the chat, uh, you know, to get this, you know, as, 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 uh, as, uh, as accurate as possible. So looking at your crystal ball, right? Or looking at your experience or what you think that event, you know, entails, tell me in the order because each of these events has a number, right? Daily electricity demand has a number, number one, time of sunrise that this day next year has number two. So the exercise is to rank, you know, in, in an order from lowest to highest, right? Or from easiest to toughest, which of, the, of these events is easier to forecast than others, okay? So for example, if I say, in my opinion, if I say, uh, Google stock price tomorrow is the easiest of all these events, then I will put a three, you know, as the first number. Then comma, I'll put the next number as the second easiest, uh, third number as the least second, you know, easiest and so forth. So rank them from easiest to toughest to forecast each of these events. There are eight events, okay? So I will give you a minute. A minute to do this exercise. I'll have my my timer here. Um, a minute, and then you know, just you know, uh, put that that list of numbers in the chat. So then we can you know we can have fun and, and compare. Remember, in some cases, there is not, you know, a very, you know, clear cut answer. So usually you have to use your, your experience. And, you know, what do you think is the best, the, is the best answer here? Okay, one minute pass. What do you what do you guys think? So should we just read our list? Uh, if, 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 if you can, if you can, uh, you know, just write it in the chat. Okay. From the first number that describes the event with the easiest to the toughest one, just you know, like like a like a list of numbers. And th and then we can we can discuss it. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Abdul. Hey, Abdul. How are you doing? <laughs> okay. Uh, Abdul, do you want to talk a little bit about your, you know, your ranking? And what was the process? Because, you know, there's infinite possible answers here, you know, permutations. But if you can talk a little bit about, you know, why do you choose that one in particular over, you know, the other, the other choices? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think the, the way the temperature behaves, it's, it's pretty uh, like uh, okay. I mean, straightforward to just, you know, mm -hmm. uh, forecast something like that. Yeah. Okay. So it's, you said that the maximum, the, the, the fifth event, the maximum temperature tomorrow is yeah. basically for you the easiest, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like for me, that's the easiest. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then you chose the second one? Yeah. The time of sunrise, let's say. Uh, exactly. This day next year, yeah, like that. Okay, 
and then we'll stop tomorrow. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Uh, let let me let, let me let me go. You know, do the rounds, and you'll see some similarities on the thinking of what I'm yeah. I'm, I'm seeing in the chat. Uh, Federica, uh, you said something different, but it's it's along the lines of uh, Abdul also. Uh huh. Hello, Federica. Yeah, okay. sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. So for me, uh -huh. uh, daily electricity demand in three days' time uh -huh. uh, is easier than right. uh, Google stock stock prices, for example. For example, than the in the next day Google stock price. Okay, but you can coincide with Abdul in terms of the easiest. Is maximum temperature tomorrow, time yeah. of sunrise, this day, next year, etc. So there's some similarities here. Uh, Andres, tell us about your, your thinking here. Because yours so is a little thing bit, that, bit Yeah, mine is, mine is a little bit different. Um, okay. And it might be because I'm a little bit jaded in my career. Um, yeah, but okay. uh, but um, so the first thing that, that, that I struggled with I was looking at the, the list is, that it all really depends on on your on how precise you want to be, right? Mm -hmm. So to give Correct. you an example, if if we talk about the timing of the Halley's comet appearance or the time of the sunrise or time of sunrise this day next year, are we are we saying to the very second because or the very millisecond? Because if we do that, if we say that, then we then it is probably it's impossible, right? To, right, yeah. very difficult. But if we talk about time in terms of like seven a.m. or November 15 or whatever the date is, then it's not that hard. That's that's or why maybe, I had those. Or maybe the year thinking. in the Halley's Comet. Maybe the year, year, precisely, yeah. precisely. Then and it's we, very easy. It makes it very correct. easy. Correct. That's that's the first the first thing I thought about. Um, very good, so very good. In that in that sense and, and along those lines, uh, I thought that the time of the sunrise and then the timing of the Halley, Halley Comet mm -hmm. appearance, if we are being fairly flexible in our, in, our, in terms of our, our definition or our position rather, then, right. then those are, are, are rather easy, easy. And then um, uh, in, in, and then after that, I started thinking in terms of uh, the sooner the events are for a mm -hmm. little bit more, com more, more complex events like a, or, or right. things like a, a, electricity demand or stock prices, then then probably the, the I don't know that easier, but at least the better our forecasts or estimates are going to be. The farther away they are, the, the harder they're going to be. For me, the the the, um, the three and 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 five are very similar. So Google mm -hmm. stock price tomorrow or maximum temperature temperature tomorrow are 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 similar in that they're both, you know, they're tomorrow to begin with, and they're the, both uh, the result of a lot of very, they're very complex systems. Correct. Uh, uh, weather and and market so that's why they're not as easy as as something as cyclical as a comet or 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 mm -hmm. time of a sunrise but definitely we can have a better idea of what the google stock price is going to be tomorrow or at least a better a, a narrower band than in six months Correct. And the same price uh, applies to exchange rates. It's uh, it's in a, in a week. Our our estimate our estimates for Google stock price tomorrow are, are going to be probably better than our estimates of exchange rate in a week. And then um, seven and and four, yeah, again, it, they're very complicated systems. I have no idea about uh, demand uh, uh, drugs in, in in Australia, so that's why it was one of my last right. ones. But uh, so, I imagine that it's a seasonal thing. It's uh, it also depends on, but it's still so it's even, a complex system. Okay, uh, excellent, Andres. So even we we have different answers instead of the ranking, there are some similarities in the way that we approach. Even though you know we're different people from different backgrounds and different experience, we approach something that is kind of similar. For example, you all three. And I am included too. Your three thought that number four, uh, predicting the Google stock price in six months' time, is the hardest. You all predicted that, okay? And you also said that 
events like time of sunrise this day next year or the timing of next Halley's comet appearance could be easy to forecast, you know, depending, depending on the precision, like Andres said, which is something that you have to, you know, you, you have to address, right? Because how, how precise do you want that forecast and that precision, is it feasible, right? Because for example, if we want to time the Halley's uh, comet appearance to the hour, <laughs> to the hour, that's going to be almost impossible, right? Okay, because there's so many factors that are inciting in that, you know, in that event that probably the hour won't be, you know, almost feasible. Maybe the month, even the year. Okay, so that gives you, as you can see, the scope of the of the forecast is very important in this context. You know, to try to make it within that reasonable, uh, you know, uh, uh, bandwidth done with of uh, uh, accuracy. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, the, the author gives you some possible answers. Okay, but the purpose of the exercise is to, you know, uh, uh, start thinking about what are the complexities of forecasting? What are the events that can be forecasted? There are some events that maybe Forecast is not, you know, the, the the best the best analysis, okay? And we're going to get into some of that in the qualitative uh, forecasting, uh, because sometimes, for example, when you launch a new product, a company launches a new product, uh, there's basically no data, uh, you know, past data for that product demand or something. We had to make inferences in terms of, okay, this product is similar to another product that we have, okay? So maybe we can interpolate that into that new product. But the new product, you need a lot of uh, qualitative, uh, uh, subjective uh, thinking there to make a most educated guess and you know, do, do your forecast. So the possible answers, uh, two and three and four were for the author, were the easiest one. And at eight and nine, okay, the exchange rate, the Google stock price were the, you know, the, 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 the toughest ones, okay? And I think we, we, we got a very good consensus on the Google stock price in six months. Who knows what is going to happen? Especially now in this market that is so, you know, so wild and volatile, okay? So and, and any questions so far about what we have been discussing? We're good? Okay, so the summary of this section, okay, in terms of, uh, the, 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 the forecast feasibility of what can be forecasted can be summed up in these four points. So the probability of an event or a quantity depends on several factors, which include how well you understand the factors that contributed. In other words, how expert you are in the factors that are inside in that event. Do you have all the, you know, all the, all the necessary data or the necessary experience or intuition that goes with it, that points to domain knowledge, right? Then how much data is available? For example, in the time of sunrise for next year, there is a lot of data because we have calculations, you know, from uh, astronomy and from physics that tells you, you can, you can very, very precise in terms of what is going to be the time of sunrise for next year, okay? Uh, given that nothing, you know, extraordinary happens, right? Then how similar the future is to the past. And this is the uncertainty, right? Uh, for example, I, I, I think of COVID really here. So when we started uh, with this uh, period of two years of the uh, COVID pandemic, there was really no, no past experience. You know, the, the only past experience that we had was uh, the Spanish flu, okay? And they were in a very different economic and social, uh, you know, circumstances that incited there. So we were kind of in uncharted territory. So for example, if you forecast that your products, depending on, you know, the COVID, how, how, is, how the lockdowns, you know, will, will impact you, if your products were going to have a trend, then you have to revise all those factors because there was something, it was like a monkey wrench, right? 
It was something that really was uh, unexpected and it impacted everything that we did in those, in those two years. Then whether the forecast can affect the thing we're trying to forecast, okay? You know, in other words, it, our, our, our forecast, you know, uh, uh, you know, kind of, you know, clouding, clouding our perception of what we're trying uh, to forecast, that can happen uh, too. In other words, you know, when it's too good to be true, you know, take a pause and see, you know, what else you may be not considering that then, you know, can give you a more realistic picture. Okay. All right. So uh, the forecast uh, really has certain methodology in terms of the quantitative uh, forecasting that we're going to be discussing in the next chapters. Uh, remember that forecasting is about estimating and predicting a future uh, event from past, you know, uh, past information. Then you need to have some goals here. For example, uh, there's a case study that we're going to be talking in exercise number one. Uh, in terms of the forecasting of weekly air traffic of passengers in a certain airline in, in, in Australia. So are the goals clearly defined in terms of what is the leeway that we have, you know, the precision that Andres was talking about, the leeway that we have within those weekly uh, forecasts, do we have, you know, that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of, of assumptions? Or the goals are too strict that then, you know, any forecast that we do, you know, will fail, okay? At least in the eyes of the stakeholders. So the goals have to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, they have to be measurable, but also they have to be attainable, okay? Then there's a process of planning, and we're going to discuss a little bit more on that, and what are the steps that usually a forecast entails in terms of defining the goals, uh, capturing the data that, that we need, preparing the data, et cetera. You know, follows a, a machine learning or, or, a, or, a, or a project, machine learning project as cycle, basically. All right, so in determining what to forecast, uh, there's an example that I took from this section. There's a couple of examples. This example is very uh, clear on what we have to, the questions that we have to ask in terms of defining what is called the forecast scope, the scope of the, of, of the analysis of the project. So let's say that we are in a manufacturing environment, okay? We're building something, a, a product. Okay, a, a, a bike sprocket, let's put it that way. And uh, planning, okay, production planning is asking you for a forecast. You are the, you know, the, the engineer, the, the, the analyst here. So the first thing that you have to ask is, are we going to be forecasting every product line or a group of products? Because that would change, you know, the way that you are going to, you know, be uh, attacking this forecast. If each product line is independent of each other, okay, it has its own line, its own production, then it's totally different than a group forecast because in a group forecast, then there are a lot of components that, you know, go 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 with, with, with each other line. There's some synergy, okay? So that's one thing. Then are we predicting a sales outlet, every sales outlet or a region or only total sales? Okay, very important because if you are predicting total sales, that's a that's an aggregation, right? An aggregation, you know, sales, no matter the groups. But if you are doing by a region, then you have to divide your data or you have to have those labels within each region. And each region then has to have, you know, their, their own time series or each outlet, depending on the, you know, if it's a customer or if it's a vendor, et cetera. So those are the questions that you have to, you know, ask yourself, to define the scope of your project. Then, are we going to forecast weekly data? It could be daily data too. It could be monthly or it could be annual. And the most important thing, and the author emphasizes that and is in bold, you have to make sure that you understand your horizon. In other words, how long are you going to be forecasting? Okay, the, the, the time, the, the time period where you're going to be forecasting those future, uh, uh, you know, uh, points. Okay, it could be 
the next week, it could be the next month, it could be the next year. And it, you know, the further you go into the forecasting horizon, the more uncertainty your forecasting is going to be. Because, you know, you can just extrapolate until a certain point, then everything is uncertain, you know, up to that point. Okay. Any questions? Good. Good. So remember, ask, you know, what is that we are forecasting? Are there any subdivisions or any hierarchy, you know, for the forecasting? Are we forecasting uh, daily, weekly, the periods? We have to make sure that we have the period because if we are going to forecast daily, you need daily data. You cannot forecast daily data with a week, week, week data. Okay, you know that's that will be your 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 constraint there. Then make sure that you understand very well your forecasting horizon. You know how will how 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 much time is that period between now and the future? Okay. All right. So uh, in this section, the author talks about forecasting data and forecasting methods, and it you know, throws what is called qualitative forecasting, already mentioned it. Uh, this, this can be covered in chapter six in our first uh, cohort that I participated, uh, we skip this chapter, okay? But qualitative forecasting, what it, what it does is that depending on the availability of your data, for example, maybe there's no, like a new product, you know, I was thinking about that new product. Maybe there's no data available or the data is not really relevant you know, to the forecast that we're doing. Then we have to move to those methods. And there are several methods. Uh, there's, a, there, there's an article here, okay? I can, I can post it in the chat where uh, they, they have real life examples of qualitative forecasting. There's the Delphi method, which is consulting the experts and getting a consensus on what the experts you know, would say in that, in that particular regard, uh, grassroots forecasting, market research, et cetera. So let me give you the link. So you'll have it uh, because sometimes, uh, you know, the data is, is, is not available or the data that you have is, is not consistent, the quality is bad, or it's not enough uh, to make a good quantitative forecasting. In this book, we're going to assume that we can do that. But you know, be 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 alert in in real world situations. Be alert on that. What kind of data do we have? Okay, do we have gaps in the data? For example, that's important because those gaps could be, uh, you know, could could lead you to a lot of problems in the in in the process. So then the author delves into quantitative forecasting, which is the main focus of this textbook. And there are two conditions that need to be satisfied for the, the practitioner to do the quantitative forecasting. The first one is that the numerical information about the past is available. In other words, there's good information about past, uh, past events. And the other one is that those past events uh, mimic, right? Or you can assume that those past events will be repeated or recreated into the future. For example, uh, let's say that we are forecasting uh, weather uh, temperature, temperature in, in a city. Let's take uh, Federica, let's take Rome, <laughs> okay? Let's stay wrong. And we're going to be forecasting for the next year. Okay, we're in December, right? For the next year, we're going to be forecasting the average temperature in Rome based on a monthly, you know, on, on a mo monthly basis, uh, 12, 12 months from, from December, the, the whole year, right? So do we have the information available from past events? Do we? I will say so, right? We have historical records, uh, you know, from temperature, you know, way past. Of course, you know, there's something 
that is happening that could give us a little bit of problem is that our climate is changing. Okay, we, if we can agree about that, in, you know, be, before delving into other things, the climate change could be an accelerator, right? Could be an accelerator, you know, to some, some patterns. But you can see, for example, that in the summer, there's going to be high temperatures, right? In the winter, there are going to be lower temperatures. So we have a seasonality, right? Uh, uh, that, that sinus uh, curve that we can expect that is going to happen during that year. And then also we can check the trend. Is the trend going up, going down, or staying uh, the same? So we have the data to, to make a good forecast within certain ranges, a good forecast of what will be the average temperature, not the temperature, the average, the mean, the average temperature between each of the next 12 months uh, from, from today. Okay, good, all right. So uh, it, it, other examples of uh, quantitative uh, forecasting, uh, any company's annual profits, okay? That could be estimated, unless it's a startup. If it's a startup, then you have to go through other similar businesses to see more or less, you know, if you can get a number in the, you know, in that in that sense, okay. But it's a company like IBM, like Apple, like Google that have a history, has information. Then, you know, you could do a, a good, you know, a good forecast. Uh, weekly retail sales, uh, traffic uh, count, uh, stock uh, transaction data. Uh, you can do uh, a good forecast, you know, uh, using uh, quantitative uh, uh, method, okay. All right, uh, the case studies, we're going to tie it with the exercise number one. Um, There's going to be also uh, an activity of, you know, an interactive activity. Uh, okay, so these are the basic steps in a forecasting task. Let me see if I can zoom it. Okay, can everyone see it clearly? The, the, the guide, okay. So the book uh, gives you five steps for you know, the time forecasting uh, process. I uh, found this, which gives you uh, uh, an additional step, which is basically the monitoring of, the, of your forecast. But the first step, and this is uh, something that is similar to uh, any, any project, any, 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 any project, is to define your goals, okay? You have to clearly define your goals that they're measurable, that they can be attainable, uh, some flexibility depending on things that are happening during the project, okay? If it's a project that is going to last for, let's say a year, you have to have certain, you know, certain assumptions of what's going to happen in that year so you can then uh, proceed to your, you know, to attain the goal. Then, the sec once you define the goal, okay? Uh, the goal that we have in the project is, uh, predict, forecast the average temperature of Rome uh, for the next year. So then we have to collect the data. What kind of data do we need for that? Uh, can anyone give me an example of what kind of data you know would you would you look for? Temperature. Uh huh. Uh, past temperatures, right? Past temperatures. Also, you can read about studies, uh, meteorological studies that have been done, you know, within, you know, the, the city, the city of Rome. Maybe there's some patterns within, you know, certain years. Uh, example, uh, you know, in India, uh, take, take any city in northern India. There's a period where there's a the monsoon period, right? When there's a, you know, or the rainfall is really. Uh, it's really heavy. So that's going to impact, you know, your forecast, your temperature, because uh, precipitation tends to, you know, cool off, right? Cool off the, the average temperature. So there could be certain, certain events that could have an impact on your, on your uh, forecast, okay? So you have to gather, and that's one of the critical steps of any uh, data science or forecasting is to gather the, 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 the relevant 
uh, uh, data. And you need to, you know, organize and do some, you know, uh, previous thinking in there. Then once you have the data, then you're going to analyze and we are the experts there, right? That are analysts, data sciences. They're going to analyze the data. In time series, which is forecasting, you are going to do some decomposition to check if, the, if there's a trend, if there's seasonality, all that. Then after you analyze, that's your EDA phase, right? You visualize you know, your, your data. Then you start uh, going to the modeling. Uh, you know, uh, putting your data into different models and see which is the model that gives you the best uh, estimate, depending on, 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 a, on a metric. Then you go to the deployment phase, the production phase. So probably in this weather, a project maybe is for a company that needs it to, uh, to optimize their agricultural uh, uh, you know, products, uh, you know, harvest or uh, production, etc. So it could be something that you know maybe doesn't have a, a direct link, but it's needed for their you know the, their process. Okay. okay, and farming are in the outside. Yeah, they need that data. They need temperature. They need precipitation. Uh, I'm also sunshine. All that. Okay, depending on the on the crop. And last thing is the monitoring. So the monitoring is once you establish, okay, you want to deploy the forecast, there are going to be some numbers there that are going to be you know, our estimates. Then when the actual data comes, for example, in the month of January, we, we gather that temperature. Is there any significant deviation on, 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 our, on our estimates or are they are you know, within the range that we predicted? So we have to monitor that because there's there could be some events that you didn't took account that then we have to you know again do a redeployment. That's sometimes it calls model drift. Okay, when the model kind of you know makes some assumptions that the new events bring new assumptions that they don't match uh, those in, in the model. So you have to keep revising and keep monitoring. Uh, your performance, okay? Good. I think this is one of the best guides that I have for you know the, the forecasting and try to you know frame it in that sense. And if you follow these steps, I don't think you should have any you know any major <laughs> major problems. And of course, you know there's always the the task of communication, okay? So you are doing this because someone needs this information. So establish certain communication channels in terms that if something happens that you know uh, modifies the goals or modifies your assumptions in a in a in a in a certain way then you can accommodate and try to then you know get that input back into the into the into the project okay all righty so this is the last section okay uh, okay, let's see. Okay, this is the last section. And this is a reminder that uh, in data science, you know that there's a computer science uh, component, there's a domain knowledge, but also there's a mathematical and statistical component. And the author reminds us that forecasting is estimating what, he's, what he calls excuse me, a random variable, okay? In other words, there's always some uncertainty about the future that you have to take into account. That's why usually when you see these estimates forecasted, you don't usually see a point. What you see is a range, okay? So the models are, you know, are prepared or are developed to give you that option. And usually the range could be from 80%, uh, you know, confidence intervals, uh, 95%, that's one of the biggest ones, okay? But usually what you are forecasting is that, it's a range, it's not a, a point in, uh, in, in time. It's a range because you know that if it's a random variable, there's going to be some fluctuations, right? 
So for example, that average temperature that we're talking in our project for, for Rome, usually the forecast will be okay. In January, we expect to have an average temperature between this value and this value. Okay, that's going to be your forecast. And the one the, the point in the middle is going to be what you uh, expect that to happen. But that's not your forecast. Your forecast is the range. It's not that point. Okay. Everyone got, got that? Because that, that's a very important concept. Okay. When, when you are forecasting, you are forecasting a range because the event that you are trying to predict is random. It has uncertainty. It's not, it's not something that you know that is going to happen. It, 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 it doesn't need to happen that way. Okay, so the forecast is a range. The more you know, tight is the range, it depends on the quality of the data, the accuracy of the model, et cetera. Okay, but it's always a range because you are predicting a random pattern. That's one of the most important concepts, at least, you know, that I gather from this uh, section. Okay, any questions? Yeah, I, maybe maybe I was late, but I, I uh, mm -hmm. there's this thing, I, will, I, I don't know whether you've already uh, discussed it, but um, uh -huh. how, how can one easily distinguish between like uh, uh, forecasting and like flipping a coin, you know? Right. Yeah, how can you easily distinguish between these things, you know? Whether you should uh, uh, okay. like a forecast and the probability, like something that you know has 50 50 chance, and you know, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, something like this. Okay. Uh, then then I ha we have to qualify this because, for example, flipping a coin, you can flip a coin, let's say, 100 times, right? Yeah. You know, do a simulation 100 times, mm -hmm. and you don't care the, the temporal dimension of it. In other words, you don't care if you flip the coin at one, one specific uh, uh, period of time and then the other. You just care about the amount of mm -hmm. the occurrence, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, the flip of a coin is not a time series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, mm -hmm. but it incorporates uh, probabilities, uh, you know, probability theory, because yeah, random, random in, in a hundred times, in a hundred times, you are going to expect if it's a fair coin, you're going to expect 50% heads, 50% tails. That's your expectation, right? Yeah. And then you have a range, right? A range that gives you a margin of the standard deviation, right? Okay, because in an experiment, you can get 51, 49, in other experiment, 52, 48, but they're still in that range. So you cannot say that that coin, because it doesn't comfort to the 50 50, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not a fair coin, okay? But here in forecasting, what we're, we're dealing is with time series. In other words, there's a component, a term for a component, time component, data component, that it gives you the sequence of the, of, of the points. And that's very important because there's some assumptions that you're going to do in your models that need that temporal, uh, temporal uh, component, okay? Yeah. So, also the, so, uh, so in, the, in, in the coin, you're right. There's a probability that there's a, it's a, there's a limited probability, but there's no a temporal component, yeah. okay? Because you don't care about when it happened. You just care about the experiment there. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. If I understand correctly, the other difference, the other, the other important difference is that mm -hmm. the, each one, in, in, in flipping a coin, for example, each mm -hmm. event is independent of Correct. the other events. So you got it. Right, it doesn't depend yep. at all. Yeah. 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 Here, right. No, no. Andres is totally correct. Totally correct. Bullseye. Yeah. Uh, uh, here, you're, you are going to assume that the previous point has information for the next event. In other words, they're not independent. Okay. Like in the flip of the coin, that each flip of the coin, it just started at the same, at the, at, at the, you know, with, with, with the same assumptions 50% heads, 50% tails. Excellent, excellent, Andres. Thank you, yeah. thank you. Yeah, that, that's one big distinction between time series and you know any other data that doesn't have that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, 
Um, let me see. Uh, okay, I think we have time for discussing one of the cases. Uh, this exercise, uh, the the first the first exercise says that for the cases mentioned in the section one point five, three and four, uh, try try to list the possible predictor variables that may be useful, assuming that the relevant data is available. Okay, so let me show you what is the case that we're going to be dealing with. And it's case number three, okay? So case number three, I'm going to read the, the, what, what the author you know, uh, says. He says, this case involves a large car fleet company that asks us to help them forecast vehicles resale values. So what are we forecasting? Values. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this company purchased new vehicles. They lease them out for three years and then they sell them. Uh, some forecast, better forecast of vehicle sales value would mean better control of profits and understanding what affects resale values may allow leasing and sales policy to be developed in order to maximize profit. So what they want to do is get a grip on that resale value from the time that they, they purchased the vehicle, right? They want to know what is the resale value so they can make a better judgment on how much you know, profit they're going to be uh, making apart from the rentals, okay? Then at the time, the resale values were being forecasted by a group of specialists. Unfortunately, they saw any statistical model as a threat to their jobs. <laughs> Okay, and we're uncooperative in providing information. This doesn't happen, right? Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Real world scenarios. Nevertheless, the company provided a large amount of data on previous vehicles and their eventual resale values. Okay, so the exercise is, um, you know, uh, I'll give you, I'll give you a minute to think it over, and then just shout some of the predictor, predictor variables that you think they're necessary for at least, you know, to gather uh, the data that we need for this, okay? So I'll give you uh, one minute, one minute. For anyone that is interested in the FIFA World Cup, Argentina is winning 1-0, half time. <laughs> so that's Thanks. going to be war. That's going to yeah. be war. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a good second half. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The second half is going to be, well, <laughs> not, not up for the hard, you know, hard impaired. <laughs> okay. So, uh, anyone, you know, just let's go, let's go, you know, do the, the rounds. Uh, what do you think do we need? What kind of, you know, predictors uh, do we need to make this? you know, this forecast. Yeah, yeah, just, I think the previous- Just, just, previous mention, resale, just mention one, just mention one. Yeah, like the previous resale, resale values, you know, that's, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the previous- re re time remember, remember that we purchased the vehicles uh, new. So we got a new price. Yeah. And after certain time, you know, let's mm -hmm. say after three years, then, yeah they're going to resell them. So from the start, from, from where they purchase, they have to have a forecast of how much that resale value is going to be, okay? Mm. So what, maybe what you're saying, Abdul, is, okay, let's compare uh, you know, similar models of cars, of vehicles, what was the resale value, right? Okay, from previous experience. Like this, something like this. Correct. Yeah. 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 That that would that would be a good indicator. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because not all the models are going to be selling, you know, the best. For example, uh, I remember that there's a, there's a study that says that Honda cars, they have a higher reserve values than let's say uh, Chevrolet cars. <laughs> yeah. Okay. At least in the in the in the U.S. Okay. And so yeah, uh, uh, previous uh, reserve values. That that's good. That's good. Uh, what, what else would you need? 
use car demand. What was that? The demand of uh, the demand of used cars. Yeah. Uh, what what is the market? You know, for that type of that type of vehicle. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Okay. What what else? And I, I think you you will need also uh, some um, information about the, the 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 buyer of the 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 buyer of the car. You know, the purchaser, mm -hmm. the one who buys the the new the, the one who the car is leased to. Sorry, you will need some information about him. Okay. Yeah, to know uh, whether they are like um some someone reliable, reckless, or some something like this. You know, how how mm -hmm. good they will take care of the car. You know. Okay. Yeah, uh, maintenance. Uh, yeah. you know, records. Okay. Uh, maybe I, I, I jotted down, was there any accidents or damages, you know, within yeah. those three years, you know, an accident or damages, because that, you know, lowers that, that recent value and also major, uh, parts replacement. For example, is the engine the original or it was replaced a transmission, you know, big, big, big items. So big here's items. a, here's a question. So uh -huh. in, if we if we're talking about these these sorts of things, uh, the accident, uh -huh. the maintenance, the things that have been wrong with specific right. cars, that's so that 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 would let you predict or that would let you forecast for the value of one car, right? But if what you want to do is build the model of the resale that that spread between buying and sell of your fleet, correct? Then um, okay, but that's another I mean, question in terms right. of the scope. How granular you want this reserve value to be? Do you want it for a, a particular model or do you want it in detail? Okay, for each car. And we have mm -hmm. the tools to do that. Right. Okay, we can go to the item. Okay, because that's how Walmart uh, forecasts its inventory. Okay, it, they go to the item, to the product, to each of the outlets, each of the customers, etc. But right, the data right. has to be available. That's the thing. Exactly. The data has to be available. Yeah, yeah. So, so the thing is that if today, if I have a fleet uh -huh. today, and I want to say how think how much am I going to sell this for for in three years? Right. Well, I, I need I, I don't I don't just need a model for 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 the for that value. I would need a model for each one of these issues. So I will have to model okay yes. of that fleet how many, of what percentage of of my cars to get in car wrecks. What percentage of my cars break down? What types mm -hmm. of so there's 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 yes. an innumerable number of models within that big that, that, that larger model. Yes, that's one of the that's one why of the issues. Right. Remember that in the, in this stage, what we're doing is kind of brainstorming mm -hmm. about yeah. what would be the useful predictors to get a good forecast for that resale value. Yeah. Maybe not all the predictors are going to be in that model, and we know mm -hmm. that you know. Uh, if you have a hundred predictors, probably ten, even fifteen, are going to be the ones that are going to be, you know, uh, you know, go, going going to the to the to, to the to the you know to the top, right? And the rest yeah. they're going to be very basically noise. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, and for example, I can say mileage will be a factor. Yeah. yeah. Maybe the car in those three years was not used that much. Okay. Right. Or it was used extensively. Okay, you know there was someone that was you know riding only the U.S. with it, so that's going to be you know wear and tear. Uh, so what, what else? What else? What, what, one other thing I, I think. So we're looking at a lot of the internal mm -hmm. features of, of 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 this model, but I think that we would also need to consider the external ones, like Correct. what's happening with yeah. the happening with the economy. What about the supply? Like what happened with the chip with the semiconductors yep. recently? <laughs> What about what about uh, yeah. the what about we, we call, rates or what about you know if we call those like externalities. In other words, you yes. know things that are outside the company that are affecting you know the the supply the supply and demand. They're very good. Uh, that the chip that 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 chip thing of the computers. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a biggie. It's a biggie. Okay, because it's depleting the inventory of available mm -hmm. cars, and then you resell value. You know, if you put in the in the market today, it could go up. Okay, and I, and I think the area also, like the geographic area, if the, yes. the roads are very bad, you know. Excellent, excellent. Yes, yes. I, I I put it down also. You know, where has the vehicle been used in? 
for example, if it's been in the northern part, let's say if, if it's the US, in the northern part, you know that the northern part has more severe weather than the southern part, et cetera. And they use salt, they use all kinds of things that can, you know, rust, you know, the, 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 the bottom of the car. So the region could have, you know, a factor in that result value. Very good. And not only, uh, 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 you know, uh, extreme weather. Also, for example, what happened in Florida in this year, we had two major hurricanes, Ian and what was the other one? Uh, I forgot the other one. There was another one. It was Ian that was the major one. There was another one that passed through here, through Orlando. I don't remember the name. Anyway, uh, Nicole or something. Uh, Ian, the problem is that there was a major flooding in you know, a big part of the state. So if you are buying a car in the state of Florida, you have to be very careful what you're buying. <laughs> okay, because probably that car got flooded. <laughs> there could be a chance that that car got flooded. So that will be a major event that, you know, it could incide in the, in the result value too. Okay, an, an example of externality too, okay? So as you can see, you know, let, let's wrap up this. As you can see, there's a lot of uh, factors, predictors, things that you have to consider. And also try to see if there's good data, uh, you know, for, for that kind of analysis. Because if there's not enough data, then you have to make a, you know, you have to make a, a judgment in terms of what we're going to use and how the forecast quality is going to be affected uh, by, by, by the lack of, of data or, you know, by, by data too, okay? All right, so basically that's uh, chapter one. Any more that you want to add? Great. Good, good. Okay, good. so yeah. uh, excellent. Uh, so next week, I think Andres is going to be uh, talking about chapter two. Yes. Okay, it's going to be a, a nice chapter because there's a lot of plotting and graphics and everything. So it's, it's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun there. So anyway, uh, have a great weekend. I'm going to watch the, the game to see if Argentina you know, can hold the, the people there. <laughs> who, who, who are they playing? Yeah, I'm going to go watch it too. Oh, right. the Netherlands. Ooh, Netherlands is tough. Man. Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah. beat the, they beat the USA, yeah. <laughs> it's a good team. It's a good, uh, it's a good oh, match. Yeah. It's a good team, see. So Argentina has to be careful there. Yeah. Go to Brazil. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right. Okay. So guys, oh, great. Uh, so ha have a nice uh, weekend. I uh, will see you uh, next Friday. Yeah. See you. Right. Take care. Take okay. care. Take care. Thanks. <laughs>